Hello, and welcome to the Alpha Male Podcast, the podcast where we get together and we don't apologize for being strong, dominant alpha males the way we were created to be by our creator, strong, dominant, and in control. So reach down, gird your loins, and saddle up for another episode of the Alpha Male Podcast. Come, let us reason together and strengthen each other in this journey. I am your host, Michael Melito. First and foremost, I am a Christian. I make no apologies for that. God is first and foremost in my life and everything that I do. This podcast is no different. You don't have to be a Christian to listen. Everybody's welcome. Just know that I come at this from that perspective and that worldview. A little bit about me in a nutshell. Grew up. Anything but affluent in a fairly small town. Grew up hunting and fishing and shooting. Played sports in school. uh, Wrestling, track, cross country. My big thing in school was competitive shooting. So I started competitive shooting even before I joined the Marine Corps at 17. I joined the Marine Corps, did multiple combat tours in Iraq where by God's grace I made it through in one piece when a lot of other good men did not. Not because I'm better, but because God chose to save me from that. After my combat tours, I was an urban warfare instructor for the Marine Corps. After my time in the Marine Corps, I went to work for LAPD, where I worked uh, regular assignments, more specialized assignments. I also worked for other agency and also worked on some task forces with some three-letter government agencies which we'll come back to because it ties into today's topic. I also serve in the United States Army, both full-time and part-time National Guard. I've been a private contractor for the federal government. I've been a competition shooter, as I mentioned, even before I joined the Marine Corps at 17. I've uh, been very blessed to win more shooting competitions than I can remember, including some state uh, championships, rifle and pistol, but I've competed in a lot of disciplines. I've been a professional firearms instructor, NRA certified, other three-letter government agency certified, advanced weapons instructor, NRA certified. I've been very blessed to have been the commander of a tactical team in a metropolitan area in the United States, where our main job, our primary purpose was to stop active shooters. And I have been a professional hunter and guide, things like elk and buffalo. But as I said in the beginning, the most alpha male thing about me is that I follow the ultimate alpha male, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Let's get into today's topic. Today we're going to be talking about lessons learned as a police officer, lessons learned in law enforcement. If you didn't listen to the last episode that was lessons learned in the Marine Corps, you don't have to listen to that one, but this one kind of ties into that as these are all kind of life lessons from chapters in life. The first thing we'll get into, probably the main thing taken out of being a police officer, is learning the deeper meaning of right and wrong. Now, let's get into that. Now, a law of man does not make something right or wrong. It only prohibits something. A law of God God himself, who created man, determines what's right and wrong for man to do. There's a term for these, malum prohibitum and malum in se. Malum prohibitum means something is wrong because it's prohibited. Malum in se is something that's wrong by nature. It's wrong by its very essence. An example of something that's malum prohibitum would be a speed limit. you driving 60 and a 55. That's wrong because somebody says it's wrong. Another example of malum prohibitum would be owning a firearms suppressor or silencer, whatever you want to call it, without paying the government a $200 tax stamp and doing some paperwork. There's nothing morally wrong with making your weapon quieter. There's nothing morally wrong with doing it without paying the government $200, but it's malum prohibitum. The government says you can't do it. They prohibit it. Some examples of 
malum and say, something wrong in its very nature. Thou shalt not steal. Stealing is wrong. Stealing is wrong by its very nature. Thou shalt not murder. Now, if you read the Bible, you'll know there's a very clear definition between manslaughter and murder. And the commandment is thou shalt not murder. Murder is wrong by nature. No matter what laws the government passes, murder is still wrong by nature. When the Nazis passed a law, when the Nazis were democratically elected and passed a law saying it was okay to murder a certain religion of people, it was still wrong. The fact that they made it legal did not make it right. If we look at prohibition, the morality of being able to drink alcohol didn't change. It's not like it was morally more right or wrong to drink alcohol in 1921 than it was in 1931 or 1941 or 1851. The morality of drinking alcohol is a constant. It's malum prohibitum. The government said it wasn't okay to drink alcohol during that time. But the morality didn't change, and that's one of the big differences between malum prohibitum and malum and say. The laws of man change. God does not change. And God made man. Made man in his very own image. God does not change. And moral right and moral wrong also does not change. I'm going to tell a story. And uh, from those of you that don't know me in real life, you'll know what an oddity this is. Because I generally don't tell stories about the war or about my time as a police officer. But let's just say this may be real. It may be hypothetical. I won't say any names. So let's just say hypothetically as a police officer in the state of California, if a man's wife, let's say from another country, let's say China, his wife comes over an arranged marriage, which is still a thing there, doesn't speak any English, and she comes over. And they're in the car driving through the bad part of town. And the man's mother, so the w new wife's mother-in-law, starts chipping away at her, starts berating her how she's not a good wife and really upsets her. And she opens the car door at a stoplight and tries to get out of the car, not speaking any English, not knowing what she's doing. She's just emotionally upset and she tries to get out of that car. And the husband grabs her and physically restrains her, trying to protect her from getting out in a bad part of town. Now somebody sees this event, and sees a woman trying to get out of the car, and a man restraining her, and they call the cops. That's pretty reasonable. Um, and we detain the parties and interview them. Now, in said state, it is a felony. Now in California, it's a shall arrest, or at least it was at the time, if a spouse grabs and leaves physical injury on a per, on the other on the other party it's a shall arrest so now you're arresting this man for a potential felony domestic violence leaving this woman on her own in a city because what are we going to do with her i mean she's not she's not uh she's not going to jail and she also doesn't speak any english so we just set her out on her own and arrest a man for something because it's malum prohibitum, whether it's right or wrong. So as a cop, I learned pretty clearly that there's a difference between what's illegal and what's right and wrong. Something could be totally legal and wrong, as in, thou shalt not commit adultery. Something can be totally illegal and have nothing morally wrong with it, as in the assault weapons ban that happened in the assault weapons ban came, the assault weapons ban went. Things that were legal one day were illegal another day and then suddenly legal again. The morality of those things didn't change. Just the laws did. Think about what a mess you would be if your morals change as often as the law and the government changed their mind. Think of what a mess of a man you would be. So build your morals on a firmer foundation than laws of man. Build them on the laws of God. Another lesson I learned, 
and that any cop will probably tell you is that your street cop, you know, your backbone of the police force, most of their job is not tactical. It's not kicking down doors. Most of it is paperwork and administrative stuff and writing reports and going to court and writing traffic tickets and doing reports and dealing with domestic violence and doing reports and writing traffic tickets and doing reports and messing something up on a report and having to rewrite reports. So most of being a police officer is paperwork. Far more of a police officer's job, especially your, uh, let's say, general purpose police officer, is sitting behind a desk or sitting behind a laptop and a police car and doing admin work than it is running down the street after a bad guy or kicking down a door. You know, and that that doesn't sell well in Hollywood or Miami Vice or Adam 12 or Training Day, whatever your, you know, generational thing was, view of the police officer. That doesn't sell well. Nobody's going to watch a movie of a guy pulling somebody over for a DUI and then spending the next eight hours doing a traffic accident report and DUI report. You know, nobody's going to do that. But that's the reality sometimes of being a police officer. Another thing I learned as a police officer, and as you heard in my bio, I've been a uh, professional firearms instructor a long time, NRA certified, FBI certified, um, and then some. I've taught at, uh, let's just say, I won't say any names, but one of the biggest firearms training places in the country. I've trained military, I've trained law enforcement, I've trained civilians. And I'll just say the lesson is that being a police officer does not make one good with a firearm. It does not make one an expert or a master gunfighter or tactical person. And that's just a reality. Now, some cops are. I certainly was more towards that. As I said, I've done plenty of competition shooting. I did competition shooting as a police officer. And I was uh, definitely in that realm. And a lot of other police officers are too. But a lot of police officers are not. And if you're a police officer, I don't think you can honestly tell me that that's not true. As we said before, a big part of the police officer's job has nothing to do with a gun. The vast majority of it. Now, I don't know what percentage of America owns a gun, but let's just say there are plenty of Americans that don't own a gun or shoot at all or maybe have shot once in their life. Um, And let's say a police officer has more training and experience in firearms than that. But your average avid civilian shooter that goes out regularly and certainly anybody that shoots and wins competitions is far and above, in general, a better shooter than your average police officer. And that's just a reality. So a big takeaway in that lesson is if you want to be good at something, if you want to be great at something, if it's a skill that you think is valuable as a man, don't leave it up to your job to make you good at it. If you want to master a skill, it's not on your job. That's on you. Take some personal responsibility. Those police officers that we talked about that you know are experts are great, They're the ones that go out and push themselves and train on their own and go shooting on their own. Or maybe they do or seek those specialized assignments, the ones that I alluded to in my bio. Let's consider this a good attribute of an alpha male. Don't wait for somebody else to make you good at something. Step up and be a man and put it on yourself to be great at something. Tying into the first thing we talked about, a law does not make something, a law of man rather, does not make something morally right or wrong. Obviously, there must be some bad laws, otherwise, laws would never get repealed or laws would never get changed. There was a time, all not that long ago in U.S. history, where, you know, the American government sadly rounded up. Full-fledged citizens, Japanese Americans, and put them in internment camps just because they were Japanese. Doesn't make it morally right just because the law 
allowed it. And just as the law does not make something right or wrong, God dictates what's right and wrong, so also being a cop does not make one a morally outstanding person. Now this next part might not be popular, but I'm not here to do what's popular. I'm here to speak the truth. And I can tell you firsthand, being a cop is a hard job. It's a trying job. But being a cop in and of itself, being a police officer, does not make one a good person. A person is a good person because he follows the laws of God. Because he is made in the image of God and he follows that out. And he is a morally good person. One's profession does not make one a morally good person. Whether it's a police officer, a teacher, a preacher, I'm sure you can all think of examples of people in those professions that have done bad things. Being a righteous man comes from one's relationship with God and with the way that one walks that out here on earth, not by one's title or profession. As I said, I was a police officer, and I know that it is a hard job. And you should be thankful that there are men and women willing to do that job for society. But I guess to put it succinctly, one's profession does not make a man moral. All right, let us wrap up a final lesson on a little bit of a lighter note. And I can't take credit for this. Um saying, and I might, it's not a perfect quote, but I heard it from Todd Jarrett, a real big uh, competition shooter. Um, And he said that military law law enforcement is about 20 years behind the curb. And he's talking about shooting and equipment. I don't know that 20 years is a hard and fast rule, but we generally see this for sure in military and law enforcement adopting things. In fact, many police officers still carried revolvers up into the 1990s. No, I like revolvers. If you haven't noticed from my bio, I'm kind of a gun guy. In fact, another podcast that I do is Gunfighter Life. If you're totally into guns and nerd out on guns, you might want to listen to that one. But I I like revolvers. I got nothing against them. I still carry one a lot of times as my concealed carry weapon. A little 357 Magnum in the pocket. But as a go-to duty gun, most police officers didn't get away from revolvers until, I believe, the 1990s. When I was a police officer... In the 2000s, there were still police officers carrying revolvers. Now, competition shooters and civilians had access and carried guns way more advanced and way better. Um, Higher capacity, more powerful, um, long before that. In fact, if we look at some uh, major turning points in police, let's say, equipment and history, there was a Miami shootout in the early 90s where the civilians... They were kind of outgunned by the civilians because they had more advanced weapons. Um, If we look at the North Hollywood shootout, which came up today in an interview, you know, uh, the average police officer didn't even have a rifle in their car. And these, you know, these civilians walking around the street had better equipment than them. I say the takeaway from that is don't think that because a police department carries it or police department uses it, that it's the best thing. As you can probably attest to if you've ever been to the DMV, government moves slow. So don't ever think that just because they're using something, that makes it the best. Look at the 9mm. There's a big swing back in law enforcement to the 9mm, and I totally agree. As I said, I'm a shooter, and I uh, I went back to the 9mm myself as an avid shooter when I was a law enforcement officer long before it was a new hot trend. I didn't do that because the department issued it to me. But the 9mm, guys, has been around, depending on your source, I think around 1902 to 1908. It's well over 100 years old. The 9mm didn't become a great round in the last couple of years when most law enforcement agencies in the FBI started going back to it. It's been a great round for 100 years. Low powerable variable optics. You know, a 1 to 4, a 1 to 6, a 1 to 8 scope on an AR-15 style rifle has been a main thing in the competition shooting world for quite a while. But it's just now starting to become popular in military and law enforcement. 
I can't say that nobody ever ran those earlier because I certainly ran one on my my rifle as a police officer, but it wasn't common. It's now becoming more common. But the main lesson from that is don't automatically assume something's better because somebody else uses it. You need to get out there and train yourself and run your gear and look at what the best gear is. You know, the Glock 22 and 40 cal was what I was issued in LAPD that did not make it the best handgun, certainly not for me and probably not for you. Don't think that because somebody else uses something, it's what's best for you. Be your own man and find out what's best for you on your own. So there's some lessons from law enforcement. I hope that uh, you've enjoyed this episode of the Alpha Male Podcast. I'll read a little bit of scripture. Joshua chapter 1. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And let us not forget what it says in Genesis. In the image of God, he created them. You are made in the very image of God. Is God strong? Is God dominant? Is God in control? You are made in his image. Don't forget it. All right, guys, with that, we'll wrap up today's episode. If you liked this, you may also like uh, Gunfighter Life. Pretty self-explanatory what that is. And if you like the important stuff, you may also like Simple Man Sermons. The preachings of a simple man called by God to share the good news of Jesus Christ. If you want to check out more, you can go to goodshepherdtraining.com, goodshepherdtraining.com, also Good Shepherd Training on Facebook, and Good Shepherd Training on Instagram. If you want to help out, you can like, subscribe, and comment to the podcast on whatever platform you're listening to this on. If you can do that, it may help others receive the message. If you want, you can go to Good Shepherd Training on Patreon. You may see a couple of other posts there to the public, and if you want some insider content, you can always consider supporting the podcast financially. Podcasts, sadly, do cost money. If you have it in your heart to give, give. If not, don't feel guilty. God provides. With that, gentlemen, get out there and have an alpha male day.